Well, um, before I get too far into this, I need to say thank you to all of you for coming. It's a hot night out there, so it's nice to be inside. Thank you also to the Sandbar Storytelling Festival for arranging this great event. Uh, I think it's just such a wonderful thing to be able to hear the stories from our community members. What a great idea. Um, year two for the festival and already becoming a Hallmark Festival in Winona, so congratulations. And if you have not participated, I encourage you to do so. Do so. It's really awesome. And thank you as well to the Winona County Historical Society for hosting this event in this great space. Uh, they're such an incredible member of our community, do so much as there are so many organizations, but Winona Historical Society really does a lot of great things for the community, so thanks to them as well. So Thurn is celebrating 75 years this year, founded in 1948. That's a lot of history to go through. We're not going to be able to go year by year. There's way too much to cover. So we're going to hop and skip and jump a little bit. Before we get started, though, and I have to take out my cheat sheet to make sure I cover everything and don't forget anything. Before we get started, <laughs> I wanted to paint a picture of what the company looks like today. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes just talking about what we are today. I think that'll help make the history more meaningful. It'll resonate more if you have a picture of what we look like today. So if I can get this thing to work. Let's start with the physical space. This is a beautiful Google map aerial view of what the company looks like. Kind of ugly, just a lot of roof space. But each of these buildings is about 20,000 square feet, and they were built over, boy, a 25 to 30 year period. So every couple of years, every 10 years or so, we do another addition. So a total of almost 100,000 square feet of manufacturing space. So that's a big number to make it a little more meaningful. That's roughly the size of two football fields put together. So that's a lot of space under that roof. That roof covers everything that is done by Thurn Manufacturing. So everything we do is done here in Winona. That's machining, that's welding, that's assembly, that's shipping, that's purchasing, that's engineering, everything in one roof. There are a few sales locations few salespeople located in other parts of the country and the world, but everything else happens right here in Winona. Oh, I can't move on yet. 115 employees total right now. Uh, we'd like to be 130. We actually have 15 open positions. So if anyone's looking for a career in manufacturing, we're hiring. Uh, 115 and about 105 of those employees work here in Winona. The other 10 would be those salespeople who are scattered around the country. And we have two people working in Europe, actually, uh, heading up our sales operation there. So what other things about the current... Oh, I remember. <laughs> I got the clearance to move forward. Community support. We really value giving back to the community. We recognize that the Winona community does a lot of great good for us, and we want to give back to the community as well. So we really make that a key focus of what we do, giving back. So many great organizations that deserve our support. In terms of products, we make winches and cranes. Now, how many of you know what a winch or a crane is? <laughs> That's a pretty good show of hands. So we make small winches. This is a small winch. We make about a thousand, well, more than that, thousands of these every year we sell. We also make really large winches. So if this winch was here in the room, it would be standing about this tall. That's uh, about a 10 ton winch. We make hundreds of those a year, not quite as many. We also make cranes, portable cranes and large cranes, and because I can't show you the entire product line, I did bring some handouts. 
you can pass these around. So these are some catalogs of our product line, which will give you a little sense of the range of what we do. Now, I know it's a really bad idea to give you something to draw your attention away from me, but I'm going to take that risk. <laughs> so this is a quick snapshot of the variety of products that we make. Over 500 different models, and we're selling them to close to 1,000 customers actively every year. Some of those customers will buy once and then never buy again. But probably a third of them are coming back repeatedly to buy from us year after year. And we're selling products mostly in the US and North America, but also around the world. So we sell a lot of products globally as well. So who uses these products? Well, the variety of uses is uh, actually quite amazing. It's one of the things that keeps Thern working at Thern interesting. We have just a huge number of customers, and the way they, the ways they come up with to use our product is just kind of astounding. Uh, they're very creative. This happens to be one of the high, more high-profile projects we were involved with earlier this year. Not every project is this glamorous, but on this project we sold 16 winches fairly large winches, they were 4,000, no, they were four ton winches. They're located right down here. This isn't a real great picture, but there are pillars that support this roof structure. This is a temporary structure that was put up and the winches actually raised that roof on the pillars. This structure was located in Kansas City. It was put up in April of this year. <coughs> and it was for the NFL draft event. So we sold the winches to a company that built this structure to host the NFL draft. They put it up, they took it down, everything went away, and our winches were part of that event. Like I said, not everything that we do is as high profile as this, but we do get involved in some fun, exciting projects from time to time. So that's kind of what Thern is like today. Now, we're gonna start going back in history. So we'll start by going back and meeting my grandparents, Royal and Lucille. This is a picture of Royal and Lucille from about 1945, so it's pretty close to the time that they founded Third Incorporated. A little bit about Royal and Lucille. Royal was born in 1909. Lucille was born in 1916, a few years after. Both of them were born and raised on farms in central Wisconsin. Now, why is that important? Because they grew up on farms and they learned how to work hard. <laughs> they also learned how to problem solve. Because farming at that time was full of a lot of challenges. And they knew how to face challenges. Now also, if you think about it, born right in that era, they both grew up during the Depression, which also taught them how to face challenges and how to be really frugal, diligent, hardworking, all of those values that they learned through those formative years were also part of what they established in Thern. And the company continues to carry those forward today. We haven't been able to shake those values, but they're very important values and that's part of why we're successful as a company. Royal, I'm not sure if this is his uh, Air Force uniform, but he joined the Air Force coming out of college and he graduated from college, he went to the University of Madison, Wisconsin, graduated from college in 1934, which is a horrible time to be graduating, middle of the Great Depression, really hard to find work. He did manage to find some work working for the Soil Conservation <clears throat> Society or uh, service in Wisconsin. That's how he met Lucille. He was working with farmers in the area and he met Lucille because she was the daughter of one of the farmers he was working with. They married in 1938 and then World War II came. 
So Royal was enlisted in the Air Force in 1942. They already had three children and one more on the way. He spent two years training here in the States and then two years over in England serving at the Air Depot in Blackpool, England, I believe. Now, why is that important? I believe, and I don't know this for sure because I was never able to ask him this, but uh, you know, I, I knew my grandfather well when I was growing up, but I wasn't savvy enough or wise enough to ask him good questions about the history of Thurn or anything like that. So I'm just guessing, but he came back after the war and he went back to work for Diamond Huller, which is a company that was located in here in Winona. And pretty quickly, after going back to work for Diamond Huller, he started thinking about going into business for himself. And I'm pretty sure that his experience as a leader in the Air Force made him really unhappy having to be a team member. He wanted to be a team leader. Because almost immediately, 1946, he started thinking about forming his own company. It took him a few years to put that together, but in 1948, he and Lucille founded Thurn Incorporated. It was a pretty brave thing to do. Oh, that's Royal in the Air Force. I forgot to show you that picture. I think that's when he was uh, in Salt Lake City training. This is the first building. It's kind of a blurry, blurry photo. But they built this building themselves. It's a 20 by 40 foot cement block building constructed in Goodview at 3764th Street West. If you drive by today, and I've done this so I can verify, there are remnants of this building, but it's totally encased in what now has become Winona Lighting or Acuity, Acuity Brands. So you'll find some buildings, I can't really pinpoint which one might be this one, but there's still industrial uh, buildings in that area. I don't have pictures of it, but a few years later, I think in 1954 or 56, they added on to this building. They tripled the size, so they were growing quite successfully. The first couple of years, though, were really tough. Uh, Royal was determined that he was going to make some products and sell them, but he wasn't that successful right away. So Lucille had to go get a job. So she actually worked in a dress, uh, as a sales clerk in a dress shop in Winona, and she also did bookkeeping for an auto parts company. I don't know the name. But she was the one who was earning the money for the family as Royal was playing around with his machinery and trying to get something going. Well, in the end, he was successful. These were two of the first, new product, first two products that he designed and manufactured. On the left is something called a corn sheller. Now, as the story goes, and I can't verify this because I wasn't there, but the story is that the first order for corn shellers came from Israel. They ordered a hundred of them, Royal built them, shipped them, and he didn't sell a whole lot more. <laughs> so that was a bit of a dead product. His other product, this is a saw frame. It's one of many designs that he had. He used to have this on his farm. I can remember helping him cut wood with this saw frame. Now, look at that beast. It's pretty scary, yeah. 1950s. So this product, he was actually more successful with. This, he was selling quite a few, I don't know the numbers, but quite a few. It started to really help him get his feet on the ground. But the real success, The real success came when he designed and built his differential hoist, right there. This is a page out of the Sears and Montgomery Wards catalog. I think this is Wards. 
So he was able to get this differential hoist into the Sears catalog in 1952. Once they were buying differential hoists, they started buying other stuff, not corn shellers, but they did buy saw frames and a host of other products that Royal would start building and inventing. So that's really what propelled him to success in those early years. Was it really $20? Yes. Okay. The prices are amazing. <laughs> if we could only go back in time. I have some sheets I'm going to hand around because these are really fun artifacts. These are not from the 1950s. They're, they're more recent than that, from the 60s and early 70s. But for many, many years, Thern sold products through Sears and Wars, and that's really what helped them grow in the 50s and 60s. Now, Royal, always being an impatient man, never enough, always wanting to do, go to the next thing, he kept himself very busy inventing additional products all the time. So he wasn't happy just to have a few successes. He really expanded the range of what Thern Manufacturing at that time. No, it was Thern Machine Country, Machine Company, sorry. It became Thern Incorporated in 1956. So he was expanding the range of product quite a bit. And in the early 50s, that's when he designed and built the first hand winch and the first data crane. And we still continue to make designs that are pretty similar to this. A lot of upgrades, for sure. But we still make these products today. So even back then, in 1950, those products have stayed successful parts of our line for almost 70 to 75 years. So as he was busy developing so many products, he needed a way to sell them that was not dependent on Sears or Montgomery Rewards. So he started his own catalogs. And Royal being the practical man he was, he always used primary colors, red, blue, and yellow. <laughs> so he had a series of red catalogs, a series of blue catalogs and a series of yellow catalogs. And then you can tell which year he was in. So these are a few catalogs which will, they're all pretty similar, but it gives you a sense of the range of products that he had developed and was selling even as early as 1962. And those products continued to sell into the 70s. Now all that manufacturing activity meant he needed more space. They had outgrown their little cement building, even though they had expanded. They had outgrown their little cement building. So they made plans in 1965 to expand into what was the new industrial park at the time, out by the airport. So they were going to expand into the first of the 20,000 foot buildings that we looked at earlier. There was a problem. 1965, their building caught on fire, burned everything to the ground, they lost almost everything. Now fortunately, when this happened, and I'm not sure of the date, but fortunately they had already been making plans for the expansion, so the construction plans were already there. They were able to kick it into high gear, and move forward at a fast pace and move into that new building and be before the end of the year. Another little footnote that's of interest on that 1965 move. 1965 was the year of the Great Flood in Winona. So while Royal was out looking at where his new building was going to be put up, this is what he saw. <laughs> the land where he planned to put his building was underwater. <laughs> so, being a smart, practical man, he figured, I'm not going to build a building there unless I raise the level of the building site 
at least five feet above what's considered flood stage level. So that's what he did. That has proved very fortunate for us. So we've maintained that level as we've done additions. We've always brought the site level up that extra five feet. And we've never had a water problem. So I think it was 2002, even this past spring, we had really high water. The water gets really high, and we have what we fondly call Lake Winona behind, I'm sorry, Lake Thurn behind the building. Some of our employees like to go out there and fish for carp, but it's never gotten inside the building. Some of our neighbors are not so lucky because they didn't raise their buildings that extra five feet, and they had to sandbag and fight off water in those high flood years. So thank you to Royal for that. Now we're gonna scoop forward a little bit and meet some other people who are important in the history of Thurn. And that's my parents, Fred and Danny. This is a picture from the 1970s and you can tell. <laughs> so Fred and Diane were both born in Winona. Diana is Royal and uh, Lucille's daughter. They are both born and raised in Winona. They met in high school, married. They moved to St. Paul, Minneapolis for a brief time, started their family there. And then they moved to Nebraska. So if you were paying attention, you heard at the beginning that I was born in Nebraska. That's why. They moved to Nebraska. They moved there because Fred had entered the seminary, he went to Bible school, Bible college in York, ne York, Nebraska, which is where I was born. They stayed in Nebraska for a number of years. Fred became a minister, he had his own congregation. We lived in small towns in eastern Nebraska. Eventually, he grew, grew kind of tired of the church life. Um, he never lost his faith, but he was dis disillusioned by the politics of the churches that he was involved with. He felt they were too concerned on growth and money and not just ministering. So he left the ministry and he worked in odd jobs. Eventually, he found his way into sales and he realized he was really good at it. Now around this time, so this would have been the late 60s, early 70s, Around this time, Third Incorporated was still growing, and Royal was looking for a good salesman. Well, where better to look than your own son-in-law? <laughs> so I'm not sure of which year it was. It was probably several years. Royal and Lucille used to come to Nebraska, visit us frequently, and on those trips, I'm sure they started talking about their need for a salesman, and it didn't take them long to convince Fred and Diane to move back to Winona, and Fred went back to work, or went to work, at Thurn Incorporated. A year or two later, Diane joined him working there. She took over the bookkeeping job that my grandmother, Lucille, had been doing for many, many years. So the 70s were an interesting era. There were two really big challenges that hit Thurn Incorporated in the 70s. One of them was product liability and just an onslaught of lawsuits. So laws had changed in the 70s. There were, there were the OSHA laws, which required Thurn to start putting labels on all their products, telling users what to do and what not to do. They pretty much had to stop making that saw frame. <laughs> your, your label would just say, do not use this. <laughs> They had to write owner's manuals, which they had never had before. And the laws changed so that a manufacturer could be held liable and sued and have to pay damages, even if they weren't negligent, which was the big change. Prior to that, you had to be negligent. In the new laws, you could be sued for product, what's the word I'm looking for? It starts with a D, can't think of it. My expert? Design defects. Defects. Defects in products 
could land you in court and you could pay damage, damages for those claims. Now the claims weren't frivolous. I'm not trying to say that. But what would often happen, think about, remember, we're selling products through Sears and Wards. Someone buys that product from Sears and Wards. They have no idea that it was made by some small little manufacturing company in the Midwest in Winona, Minnesota. An accident happens, they think they're suing Sears or Wards. They're gonna sue for a bunch of money because Sears and Wards have a bunch of money. Sears and Wards patched that liability down to Thern and we had to fend off those, those lawsuits. It was costing the company a, a lot of money and a lot of time. And it used to drive my grandfather crazy. Late in the, I can't, can't remember the year, it must have been early 80s, Sears and Wards had started requiring all of their suppliers to carry more and more and more insurance every year. And it got to a point where they were asking Thurn to carry a million dollars annually on their insurance policy. And that ended up being the limit. That's when my grandfather said, enough is enough. Whether it was a good decision or a bad decision, I don't know. I wasn't there to run the numbers with him, but he ultimately decided, I'm not doing it. And he stopped selling through Sears and Wards. Now you can imagine that's a pretty big drop in revenue. So it was a big decision. Now fortunately, and this is where Fred comes in, Fred had been building alternate sales channels all those years. So even though they lost the Sears and Wards business, they were able to survive because they had alternate methods or alternate customers to sell to. Oops. The other thing that happened in the 70s, this was one of those 70s bulletins. Again, you can kind of tell, 70s material. We started to see some of our highest volume product. The market share was chipping away because we were seeing cheaper product coming from overseas. My dad used to have this, his favorite phrase was the Asian contagion. And I think most of the products were coming from Japan, but for many, many years, products coming from overseas were seen as cheap and not worth the money you were going to pay for them. That started to change in the 70s. This was the era where the quality started to climb, and these products became very viable to buy from alternate sources. So we used to sell tens of thousands of this every year. I can remember one of my first jobs, I would manually attach a safety latch to a hook. We'd buy barrels full of hooks from Peerless Chain or Crosby, whoever the supplier was, and one by one, we'd put safety latches on those hooks. It kept me busy for a long, long time. <laughs> but we used to sell tens of thousands of these. Over the period in the late 70s, early 80s, that volume started to decline. And that hit us not only with this product, but several, several other of our successful product lines. <coughs> That's again where Fred came in. Fred, uh, I think through his training as a minister, he was and still is an incredible <coughs> people person. So he really knew how to connect with people, even if it was over a long distance. He had empathy for them, he I'm understood sure their problems. There's Siri, thinking she's smarter than me. <laughs> Fred could have empathy with them, understand their problems, and he would work hard to come up with a solution, even if it meant that we're going to build something that isn't part of our standard line. Now, that used to drive my grandfather nuts, because my grandfather was all about standardization and volume, and Fred was about customization and doing what the customer wants you to do. But guess what? In an era where the standard product is no longer selling, you needed something, and Fred's solution was there at the right time to keep them going. And it really helped us become a niche product provider in the late 80s and through the 90s. 
This was one of the projects that Fred uh, likes to talk about a lot. These were winches that were sold to, I don't know who the customer was, but they ended up at the Kennedy Space Center. This is the shuttle launch platform. And our winches actually raise and lower the work platform that we was used for maintaining that the shuttle launch or the shuttle. So he was actually able to go there and see these winches in action. Two more things to talk about. So in the 90s, we started to uh, focus on those niche products. And again, Fred was the one who would come up with these ideas. So the story that he likes to tell about this one, we went to a trade show in Kansas somewhere in 1988, and we were showing a broad range of products and people kept coming up and talking about this product. And Fred would ask them, well, are you interested in, in getting one? And they'd say, oh, no, 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 we have one already. And we love it. So he started asking more questions and he found out that wastewater treatment plant operators all had this crane and were using it and they loved it. So he had identified a new market to go after. So we came up with, we already had the kit crane, we made a few changes, and we changed the name to the wastewater pump hoist. <laughs> and we sold a ton of them. We're still selling them today into that market. It's one of our largest markets. In fact, we're the market leader in the wastewater data crane pump hoist market. <laughs> that led to an expansion of our data lines so at the time of that trade show, we had two Davit products in our line. We now have over 25, a full range from low to high. Not all of them are sold into water and wastewater applications. Many of them are, that's still our strongest market for this product. But we branched out into all sorts of industrial markets, marine, construction. We're selling a lot of these. This is a very popular product for us. And it's a unique product. Not many competitors are making something like this. The other market where we did kind of the same thing, in 2000, we launched into a theater line of products. Now, for many, many years, we had been receiving phone calls. You'll remember back to the 1970s when we had to put all those warning stickers on our product. We said, not for lifting people or things over people. Well, we were getting calls from people in high schools who were saying, hey, I've got one of your winches here, and it's raising and lowering a light bar, and they were looking for a replacement winch or some repair parts. Our immediate response was, no, 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 no. You've got to take that product out of service. It's not suitable for that application. Now, whether they did or not, we don't know. But we didn't have a product to sell for that use. And we were telling our customers not to use it for that. Well, it didn't take long before we started to recognize that there's a pattern here. Maybe we should look at coming up with a product that we can sell for that use. It took us several years to finally do that. We were working with customers who knew a lot more about it than we did. I think the effort started in the late 90s. In 2002, we launched these two products. It's a winch on the left called a clue winch and then a drum winch. They're both specifically designed for use in theaters. So in the years, the 20 or so years that have passed since then, we've expanded the range of theater product drastically. This is now one of our primary markets. We're selling into projects around the country for sure, a few projects around the world. We become one of the market leaders. This is a photo actually of Winona State University. The rigging system over there was replaced, I think in, uh, sorry, not 19, 2018, <laughs> or around then. It's all Theron gear now. In fact, almost every single theater in Winona, the middle school, the high school, the Masonic Temple is an entirely third stage rigging system, St. Mary's. Not all of them are entirely third stage, but all of them have some of our product in them. 
And many of the high schools and colleges and universities in the region have our, our product as well. So this has become a really successful line for us. That's all I have. So that's 75 years of history condensed into about 45 minutes. Thank you all. We've hit, we've passed the top of the hour. Thanks again for coming.